Okay, cell biology fans, I'm going to finish our lecture about uh, proteins and amino acids and then go on to the next lecture about membrane structure. So we had left off talking about the evolutionary conservation of structure and function showing this particular cartoon diagram in which we see the evolution from yeast to worm to humans of a protein which has similar functions but as we go to the higher evolved species human we see that there's additional domains that get added and this is really due to the complexity and structures that um, have been generated over the course of time and the complexity of the, the I guess what I'm trying to say is the fact that we as humans have become the most highly evolved species. So you see additional domains that are, these are still strings of amino acids with primary structure linked together through peptide bonds. They have secondary structure which is generated by the hydrogen bonding of the backbone chain um, and that leads to alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. They have tertiary structure uh, which is due to the uh, non-covalent bonding of the R groups or through the uh, covalent bonding of cysteines to one another within a certain polypeptide chain and then if there's more than one polypeptide chain they would have quaternary structure. So in this schematic diagram which is basically a rectangular box with some boxed domains within it. You see an amino terminus that has a fatty acid chain linked to it. It leads to an SH3 domain, an SH2 domain, and a kinase domain followed by the C terminus. And I'm going to show you how this type of protein could fold and be regulated based on the different domains that it possesses. So an SH3 domain binds to polyproline regions in another protein or within itself. So remember I told you proline has that special bond that causes kinks to be made and what happens is uh, the SH3 domain recognizes that kink in a protein. SH2 domains bind to phosphorylated tyrosine residues in a particular sequence of amino acids. So there's many, many different SH2 domains and then there are many, many different sequences of phosphorylated tyrosines within a particular sequence of amino acids. And as we said uh, last time in class, kinase, a kinase is an enzyme that phosphorylates another protein. So if we take a look at this particular protein, and it folds up into this shape, right? So you see, come in. I forgot. I'm just going to let it run. So Hello! <laughs> okay, so if we take a look at this protein and you see the amino terminus is at the end of where the CH3 domain is, I'm sorry, the SH3 domain, and that's linked to the SH2 domain. And in the left-hand side, what you see is that the SH2 domain, in this case, is bound to a phosphorylated tyrosine residue. So the red dot is supposed to be a tyrosine. Obviously, it's phosphorylated with the P, and that is being being recognized by the SH2 domain, and it's causing this protein to fold in a particular way. Right, and we then go along in the protein. You see, there's a, a kinase domain, and then there's a loop of protein that also has a tyrosine, which is going to play a role later. That that loop is uh, interacting with part of the kinase domain, etc. Okay, if this protein gets dephosphorylated by a phosphatase. That means that it's going to take a phosphate group off, and in this case it's taking the phosphate group off the phosphorylated tyrosine. Now the SH2 domain no longer can bind to the phosphorylated tyrosine. It's not phosphorylated. So the protein begins to change shape, right? So changing the structure changes the function. On the bottom left, that's where we were left off, the protein no longer is going to start to unfold. And if another protein is around, right, this activating ligand, it can bind. And what you see here is that it has a phosphorylated tyrosine residue in it. So the light green shape um, has a phosphorylated tyrosine residue that's binding to the SH2 domain. But there's also a polyproline 
region, which is binding to the SH3 domain. So that's causing the structure, the new structure of the protein. And in that case, what happens is that new structure with the activating ligand causes the kinase to become active. All, right? and all that means is that the structure's changed and now the kinase has become active. And it can actually phosphorylate the tyrosine that's in that loop. And once the tyrosine in the loop gets phosphorylated, it can move out of the way and then it leads to an incredible an incredible enhancement of kinase activity. So the first activity that we see with the kinase is called autophosphorylation and usually auto there's a lot of proteins that do this. They autophosphorylate themselves. So that's basically making themselves happy. And then once they do that, they can then go on to cause phosphorylation of other proteins outside of themselves. So that's the protein that's on the right. And so together what happens is these two particular um, changes in structure lead to dramatic changes in function. So understanding these protein domains is really important. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. Protein structures can be regulated um, based on both temporal and spatial activation. Temporal means when it happens in time, right? Is it on or is it off, right? Temporally, it can be turned on at the right time or the wrong time. And spatially, right, is it turned on at the right time in the right place? So proteins have to get to the right place to function. Specificity, right, the specificity of that activity depends on whether the proteins are going to function correctly. So that you need to begin to think about these, right? How can this happen in temporal and spatial, right, time and space? All right. So at this point, I hope you can think a little bit more about how uh, proteins can change their structure, which leads to changes in function. We're not going to switch gears completely and talk about cellular membranes, membrane proteins, methods to study membranes, and their associated proteins. So uh, this should go pretty quickly. There's not a lot to this, um, and let's just get right into this. Membrane structure is all about the components of what make membranes, and in our cells we have phospholipids. Phospholipids, all right, phospholipid is a two-part molecule. It has a hydrophilic, which is actually the phospho part of this. It has a phosphorylated hydrophilic head, which wants to interact with water, and they have hydrophobic lipid tails. And those lipid tails want nothing to do with water. So these molecules are called amphipathic or amphiphilic, meaning they have two different uh, desires, right? They, they're what's you know, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. There's one part that's hydrophilic, there's one part that's hydrophobic. So amphipathic, amphiphilic. Membrane, um, membranes are made out of these particular structures, and the beauty of this is that they can self-generate a membrane without any additional uh, energy being put into it. So they will generate themselves spontaneously. Our membranes aren't really that different than the membranes of uh, bacteria. We're all made out of phospholipids. This is a silly little picture showing you what a phospholipid bilayer looks like. It's two layers of phospholipids that are interacting via their phospholipid tails. Excuse me, phospholipid tails. And the lipid tails will automatically do this when you put them in solution to minimize their interactions with water. This is just like the putting the oil in water. The oil wants to minimize its interaction so they separate. In this case, they can actually separate into the two different sides of the membrane. So the both the hydrophilic heads on the extracellular surface of a cell as well as the hydrophilic heads on the intracellular side are interacting with the aqueous environment, whereas the hydrophobic tails are in an environment that actually excludes water. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite uh, images showing you two cell membranes uh, with an intercellular space. Inter is between cells, intra is inside, and you can see they look like little railroad tracks. We've already discussed this once or twice. The little railroad tracks 
uh, what you can see in an EM picture are the proteins that are embedded in the, pro in the lipid bilayer. And the cartoon diagram is showing you that there are lots of proteins embedded in the lipid bilayer. And quite frankly, you can't really see the lipids at all in the EM. What you're seeing are just the proteins. And I already said something about this, but you know, the railroad tracks, if you think about railroad tracks, they have to be equally spaced. And that's not going to be true in cell membranes. At this resolution, you may not be able to see differences in the distance between the, the two phospholipid heads, but there are places in membranes where we can see that difference. So the phospholipids that we talk about right, are hydrocarbon tails. And one is usually saturated and one is usually unsaturated. So saturated means that there's CH2, 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 CH3. No double bonds. And what that does is create a longer, more linear type of structure. Whereas unsaturated means that there's a double bond somewhere. There's resonance, as we now love to say, because we know the word resonance again. We meaning me. All right. And uh, the unsaturated tail actually has kinks in it, similar to kinks in proteins that are caused by polyproline domains. So when we're making a, a membrane uh, for a cell, right, the phospholipids, the heads are going to be important, and the length of the tails on the lipids are going to be important. And this is important because of how a cell functions. Everybody knows that membranes are semi-permeable. And the semi-permeability of the membrane is important. I like to think about this as um, butter is basically a lipid, right? And butter at four degrees as we all know, is this hard chunk of butter. If you take butter out of the refrigerator and you try to butter a piece of bread, it puts a hole in the piece of bread. And that's because the butter is quite hard. It's packaged very tightly. Whereas if you leave butter out at room temperature, especially at room temperature in my house where the air conditioning is pretty bad, you know, the temperature in my house can be 90, you know, that butter, you take that butter and you slice it and put it on a piece of bread and it spreads all over the piece of bread because it's at a different phase, right? There's a phase transition between hard and soft and that hard and soft liquid to crystalline is because of the saturation on the butter. So the where phase transition occurs, the temperature is due to how much um, uh, saturation and unsaturated bonds there are. What else is going to matter for taking some phospholipids and making, a pro uh, uh, making them into a cell membrane? Hydrophobic force and van der Waals interactions, right? Hydrophobic force is going to try to get rid of all the water where we have the lipid tails, and van der Waals interactions is going to determine how close the lipid tails can get to one another before repulsing each other. I always say there's four flavors, four major flavors of phospholipids, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylserine, and sphingomyelin, PC, PE, PS, and S and M. SM. All right, these, these are the four major actors in creating cell membranes. Our cell membranes, uh, ma any mammalian cell membrane, any bacterial cell membrane, there are other specialized ph phospholipids, and we'll talk about a couple of them in this class. Uh, not too many, but but there are special phospholipids. Uh, here, what I want you to note is that phosphatidylserine is the only one that has an actual negative charge to it, and that's going to become important. We're going to talk about it shortly, but um, some of these phospholipids are, are found more on the inner leaflet of a cell as compared to the outer leaflet of the cell. <clears throat> and one of those is phosphatidylserine. It's on the inner leaflet. And when cells get damaged, there's something that causes the phosphatidylserine to flip to the outside. And now the cell has a negative charge on the outside. And there are cells in our immune system that recognize that phosphatidylserine's negative charge and will eat that cell because it knows it's damaged. You don't need to know the structures, okay? All you need to know is that they have fatty acid tails. One of them is saturated, one of them is unsaturated, and that they have a phospholinked phospho head group. And so if you look at each of these, there's a phosphate that's linked to something that looks remarkably similar to what we see on amino acids, right? So these are 
these are structures that allow for the formation of both the hydrophobic region and the hydrophilic region. Phosphatidylethanolamine is PE, phosphatidylserine, the second one is SE, and it has that negative charge. Phosphatidylcholine is PC, and sphingomyelin is SM. We talk about asymmetry of the phospholipids. As I said, phosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin are normally on the outside, which means that phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylethanolamine are normally on the inside. Now, one of the other things that you're going to learn about is how we get sugars to be um, on lipids. So lipids can be modified with sugars and they're called glycolipids. And you only ever will see glycolipids, okay, that face the outer region. So there's never sugar molecules um, that face the cytoplasmic side of the cell. And that's because of how these sugars get added and, uh, and we'll talk about that in sort of some gory detail. Uh, on this slide I mentioned one other phospholipid which is really important it's called phosphatidyl inositol PI and we'll talk more about that it's mostly on the inside and it's really important for cell signaling. Another really important player in creating our membranes is cholesterol. And while we're now in this crazy phase of you need to have really low cholesterol, you, you can't have no cholesterol. Cholesterol is required for your cells to function. Uh, if you look at the structure of cholesterol, it has these rigid ring structures that are linked to basically a hydrocarbon chain. Uh, the hydrocarbon chain right, is nonpolar, just like the lipid fatty acids on uh, phospholipids. The ring structure, um, it's basically a steroid ring and it has a polar head group at the very end. It has a hydroxyl. And so that hydroxyl group, who does that hydroxyl group want to interact with if these are interacting with membranes? It wants to interact with the uh, phospholipid head that has um, Right, so that ha the phospholipid heads are hydrophilic. So the polar head group on um, cholesterol, the hydroxyl, wants to interact with those. When cholesterol is inserted in membranes, it sits between the, the phospholipids, and this may seem confusing, okay, but it actually makes the membranes a little less fluid because of the rigid structure of the steroid rings. The rings can't move as much around uh, themselves, right, so there's some rigidity there as compared to the uh, lipid tails on phospholipids. So the more cholesterol you have, the less fluid a membrane will be and less fluidity decreases permeability. So different membranes inside of cells will have different amounts of cholesterol depending on how permeable they need to be. Okay. This is talking about those structures within structures. When we have these uh, phospholipids that are interacting with one another, occasionally we have regions where we have more saturated hydrocarbons. So that means less double bonds, longer, straighter lipid tails, and this creates a region in the membrane called a lipid raft. And lipid rafts are going to be really important in cell signaling. It seems as though that they're a location for signaling molecules to go to, and uh, what's interesting is one of the reasons they originally found them was because they're really filled with cholesterol, and sphingomyelins, so sphingolipids. So SNM and cholesterol go hand in hand in high concentrations in lipid rafts. Uh, as I said, the lipid rafts are important for cell signaling. In particular, there's a lot of this that goes on in immunology. We talk about it. Um, how did they originally find this? Well, you can treat a cell with a drug called beta-methylcyclodextran, BME, okay, beta-methyl BMC, I guess we call this. 
uh, beta-methocyclodextran, and it takes cholesterol out. So if you treat cells with this beta-methocyclodextran, all of a sudden people found that these immune cells stopped signaling. They were no longer able to do their job. And that's how we figured out that there were different domains and that the proteins that are involved in cell signaling are recruited into these lipid rafts. This is just recapping. So the outer leaflet contains phosphatidylcholine and uh, sphingomyelin. The inner leaflet contains phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylethanolamine. Um, flipping, flip-flop, occurs, but it doesn't occur very frequently. It actually requires energy, except in the case where cells are undergoing uh, damage or they're in distress and that is a signal so to apoptose so a cell will do cell suicide which is kill itself through a process called apoptosis and during that time phosphatidylserine flips from the inside to the outside. I already said phosphatidylinositol is going to be very important for signaling and it's on the inner side and glycolipids are always on the non-cytosolic side of the membrane. And we'll talk about that when we talk about how proteins and how glycolipids get made. Well, a lot of the pro a lot of the membrane is made out of phospholipids, but the other really important part of these membranes are the proteins. And there's two types of proteins: integral membrane proteins and non-integral membrane proteins. Integral, if you want to think about it, is in the membrane. Integral in the membrane. And so what that does is means that the proteins that are embedded within a membrane, as shown in this cartoon, they also are considered to be amph amphipathic or amphiphilic because some portion of it is interacting with the lipid tails, so they're hydrophobic, and some portions are going to be interacting with the extracellular space or the intracellular space, and those portions of the protein are going to be hydrophilic. This, these cartoon diagrams show you integral membrane proteins. Each one of these is considered an integral membrane protein. So let's talk about the first one. Number one in this shows you something called a one-pass transmembrane protein. If the top portion of the picture is the outside the cell and the inside of the cell is where the numbers are, it would have a short extracellular domain that is linked to the transmembrane domain, which is here shown to be an alpha helix, which is then linked to the uh, inside part of the intracellular domain. And the little red squiggly line is actually a lipid modification that is occurring to on an amino acid, which helps anchor the protein in the membrane as well. If it only had just the lipid modification and no alpha helix, it would not be an integral membrane protein. So a part of the protein sequence has to be in the membrane. And it doesn't have to be in both of the lipid um, layers, right? It's a bilayer, so you have one set of phospholipids on the bottom, one set of phospholipids on the top. As you can see, if you look at number four, that is considered an integral membrane protein. It has an alpha helix, but that alpha helix is only in one half of the phospholipid bilayer, but it's still considered an alpha helix, and that is still considered uh, a transmembrane protein. If you look at number two, that goes through the membrane three times. So it, it starts on the outside, goes through the membrane, comes into a loop that comes back out of the membrane. And these are actually quite common structures. And this is called a three-pass transmembrane protein. That's pretty easy, three alpha helices. You can easily tell how many passes. Number three is showing you basically a beta barrel, right? And that's beta sheets that are connected, right? Beta barrels are are made of beta pleated sheets which are interacting through the secondary um, forces so the interaction of hydrogen bonding on the backbone chains and you see little loops and so that that protein has a significant amount of amino acids that are sticking out towards the the hydrophobic portion of the membrane and any of the amino acids that are hydrophilic, not any, but a lot of hydrophilic amino acids will point towards the inside of this aqueous channel. So there, we're going to talk about different types of proteins like this, single pass, triple pass, whatever. Uh, this is just showing you, right, a beta barrel, and if it's turned on its side, you can very clearly see that it has 
uh, a poor, and this is the porins that came from, uh, we have a lot of porin molecules in our mitochondria um, in chloroplasts, and that's basically because it was a structure that was made in uh, prokaryotes. Uh, that channel is aqueous, and things can go through it. The other choice, if it's not an integral membrane protein, it's a peripheral membrane protein. And these don't have any portion of the protein in the membrane. They could be associated with the membrane, and they're usually bound by some sort of non-covalent interactions. So let's look here. Okay, protein number five, right? This is just a, a peripheral membrane protein that happens to have a lipid modification that allows it to be associated with the membrane. There's no portion of the protein in the membrane, it's just a lipid that was added to this, uh, I think this must be the N-terminus of this protein, so it's associating with the membrane. If you look at number seven, the green protein is a peripheral membrane protein that's associating with a transmembrane protein, a one-pass transmembrane protein. Same thing with number eight. One, number seven is interacting on the cytosol oxide, number eight is interacting on the uh, extracellular side. And if you look at number six, number six is a protein that has been modified with a phosphorylated tyrosine linked to some sugars, linked to another phosphate, which has a lipid modification. So all of these are considered peripheral membrane proteins, all of the green proteins. Uh, one of the things that we need to do in this class is to begin to talk about methods for understanding cell biology and we're just going to talk about a couple of them here predicting protein structure and you can do that based on just the amino acid sequence or based on uh, predicting structures of alpha helices, beta sheets and you can even predict uh, tertiary and quaternary structures. Another thing that people have done is something called freeze fracture. It went out of style for a while but it's come back to look at what's actually between two membranes. Um, there's the production of liposomes, and I'll tell you about that, but that's basically making uh, lipid structures that are 3D, all right, and I'm saying they look like this, but they're little tiny liposomes, they're little tiny phospholipids that we can make into little balls in the lab, um, and we can study proteins with that, and then you need to understand how detergents can solubilize membranes. So the first thing I want to talk about is hydropathy plots. So a hydropathy plot, uh, as shown here, is looking at the amino acid sequence of a protein. And you use a computer program to say, OK, we're going to look at regions of amino acids. Let's say they look at 10 amino acids at a time. And uh, let's look at part A, where you have glycofluorin. And on the top there, in green, they're showing you the schematic diagram, the rectangular, tri rectangular what is it, box with amino terminus and carboxyl terminus, and there's a domain in there. Um, and what you can see is that if you take 10 amino acids and say, okay, is this hydrophilic or is it hydrophobic? Okay, and then they take the next 10. So this was from 0 to 10, then they took from 1 to 11, and then from 2 to 12, and then 3 to 13, etc., etc., etc. How hydrophobic and how hydrophilic is it? So in the left panel, you see the y-axis says hydropathy index. What the hydropathy index uh, determines is how difficult is it for, uh, for a piece of that protein, how, the uh, section of amino acids, to be solubilized in water. And if it's difficult to solubilize in water, it means that it's hydrophobic. So regions that are positive or above the, the line, the zero line, are hydrophobic regions, whereas regions that are shown below the line are more hydrophilic. All right, and so if you look on this particular, on the plot on the left, the glycophorin, it has a region uh, shown below the, the zero of the y-axis, and approximately from amino acid zero to 55 or so, there's a region that's hydrophilic. It's below the line. It's easily solubilized in water. Then it goes to a region, so from amino acids 55 to approximately, 
uh, 80. There's a region of amino acids that are mostly hydrophobic. Those regions are more difficult to solubilize in water, and they are shown above in the rectangle as the green uh, rectangle in a rectangle. And then the final region from approximately amino acid 80 to uh, 125, 130, the rest of the C terminus of the protein, once again, shows a region below the zero on the y-axis. So that region is hydrophilic. This would suggest that glycophorin is a protein that has one transmembrane domain. The, the dark green region shown above the, above the zero on the hydropathy index is hydrophobic and that is probably a transmembrane domain and it could be an alpha helix, it could be beta sheets, we don't know but we just know that it probably is a predicted transmembrane domain and keep in mind these are just predictions based on amino acid sequence. Now, if we look at the one on the right, all right, you start with the amino terminus and we go to the very far end and what you see is this one has a lot of regions above the line and those regions above the line are the hydrophobic regions of the protein. So above the line means that it's hard for those to be uh, solubilized in water because they don't want to have anything to do with water. So those are hydrophobic regions. And this we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And very interestingly, there's a huge uh, family of proteins called 7-pass transmembrane proteins. So anything above the line is probably a transmembrane region, and everything below the line is not. Now, in the right-hand side, I hope you can see that they've arbitrarily given you some light green, and some of that light green is on the top of this hydropathy index. So, what they're saying here is there's actually maybe some portions of this that aren't transmembrane regions, but they still are close to transmembrane domains, so they're a little harder to solubilize. Okay. For the purpose of what we're doing, if it has a region above, we're considering that a transmembrane domain, and if it has regions below, those are not transmembrane domains. So what would you do between number one and two and part B? Well, I would say that there's a transmembrane domain, and then there's a region that links it to another transmembrane domain, and maybe, right, it's a very small region, maybe it, it's not a big loop in the in the cytosol or in the extracellular space, but there's a loop in there. So you use these to draw amino acids, and we'll do this in class. So these are the words to what I just said to you. So we think of hydropathy as how much energy is required to solubilize a segment of the protein in water. And a really positive number means that it's a hydrophobic portion, whereas a very negative number means that it's very easily soluble in water. So here's a more likely example of what you'll see, and this one's really hard to understand. It's really confusing because if you look at this, this is a, an amino acid transporter. Um, you can see the diagram on the bottom is just a cartoon diagram, and it's showing you how this protein sits in the membrane. So it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. It's a 12-pass transmembrane protein. And if you look at the plot up above, you would I think you would have a hard time saying exactly which 12 of those are going to be the transmembrane domains. It's way noisier than, than what is originally given. So on an exam, I would definitely make it easy, right? It would be up and down and up and down. It wouldn't be squiggly lines that you can't understand. But this definitely comes up on an exam. I'll give you a hydropathy plot and say what kind of protein would this be? I can give you a protein and I can say how would you draw the hydropathy plot? I could say this is the activity we want. What kind of protein do you think we would need and what would its hydropathy plot be? Those are pretty typical exam kinds of questions. All right, that's hydropathy. The next one is freeze fracture, and I call this the Oreo cookie method. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever taken an Oreo cookie, and you've tried to separate the, the cookie from the fluffy stuff, the white fluffy stuff, and, you know, people do it, and then they eat the fluffy stuff, and I don't know what you do with the cookies. I don't do any of that. I take the whole cookie. The whole thing goes in my mouth. It's one shot and done. You know, one little sleeve of those cookies, that's a single serving for me. So, 
In phrase fracture, what we're doing is we're basically saying that the two cookies are the phospholipid heads and the white are the lipid tails. Um, but think of it as a double stuff, so that you have white tail and white tail, white lipid tails on both the cookies and that you're trying to separate the two. When you separate the two, what happens with cookies? Sometimes you get the white fluffy stuff all on one, sometimes you get it all on the other. Usually you get a mix on both. In this case you take cells and you freeze them in liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is really cold, really, 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 really cold. So the cells are completely frozen um, into basically a block of ice. And then you fracture the cells uh, between the layers of the phospholipids. And this is just a cartoon showing the, the frozen cell on a piece of ice and when you break the ice, with they usually they call it with a knife, you bang on it with a knife and you pull one, top off, one part off. In some cases, right, you might leave part of the membrane in the bottom, so on the bottom left, the E, and I don't care about E face and P face, just don't care. Okay, but you see the red, some of the membrane is left on the left side and some of the proteins that are embedded in the membrane are on the left and on the right the piece that was taken off of the top and put over to the side you see that the inner membrane is still intact the outer membrane is partially gone and that the proteins you can still see proteins embedded so this is what it really looks like and they're showing you one is a P face and one is an E face so they've taken something and flipped it over and every little dot that you see in this three uh, this EM picture is basically a membrane protein, a transmembrane protein. So I hope that you get, all right, just looking at this one image, that membranes are filled with proteins, filled with proteins. There's just tons of proteins in there. All right, there's lots of phospholipids, but there's tons of proteins. Okay, on that E face is where we've actually taken some out, so some are st still stuck in in this piece, but the remainder are in this E face, and you can see them. These have to be large proteins. There's a severe limitation to this because of the size of the proteins we're able to see. So small, tiny little proteins you're never going to see, but these are large proteins that are embedded in membranes. This can give us information, right? What if you mutate a protein and all of a sudden you lose half of the proteins in this membrane? Well, maybe that mutation had a huge change in the structure which led to it no longer become, being a transmembrane protein and now it's no longer there. So you very easily can see something happening. There's an old school method of right, trying to understand uh, lipid structures and, and phospholipids of cells and right, we're really interested in looking at cells and the membranes but we're sometimes right you don't really necessarily want all the stuff that's inside of a cell so the old way people used to do this was they would take red blood cells and they would pop them open through a process called hypotonic lysis hypotonic hypo means right not enough below the level of tonicity you put a, a red cell, red cells are supposed to be in your body and your body is basically in saline. And saline is 0.85% uh, sodium chloride so there's a particular amount of solutes in your protein and we call this a buffer. When we remove that, so you take red cells out and you put them in water, now they're in a very low tonicity, what happens is the water will rush into the cell. So cells are permeable to water, they rush into the cell and they pop the cell open. And if you do this at just the right uh, temperature for the right amount of times, you can create basically a little hole in the structure of the red cell and everything that's in the red cell, which is almost just virtually nothing except for hemoglobin, will come out. And the beauty of this is now we just have a membrane. It's a baggy, right? This is just a bag that's holding hemoglobin. That's what red cells are for. And you can reseal them really easily. So you can actually just, so they call this a leaky ghost when it's open. So it's a ghost of a red blood cell, right? red blood cell ghost. It, you can seal it, so it's a sealed ghost. So you can use that to try and understand membranes. Or you can actually disrupt that whole open uh, leaky ghost and right so if you shake that up or use sonication which is using sound waves it can break the membrane into smaller pieces and some of excuse me some of those will seal inside out so you have the blue uh, portion of the phospholipid on the outside whereas some of them will seal right side out 
meaning the same side that was out previously. And then you can use those to study membranes. So that's called a red blood cell ghost. You might see that in some of your uh, reading. So why do we care? You, you should always come back to why do I care? Do I care? Do I really care? Do you really care? I'm not sure that you really care. Uh, I really care because I love trying to understand how proteins function and how they how they're sitting in a membrane can tell you a lot about their function. Right? Something that's sitting in a membrane with uh, very little extracellular domain but a huge intracellular domain might tell you that it's really important for something that's going on inside the cell and not so important for something that's going on outside the cell and vice versa. So how can we study this? Well, you can use radioactivity, you can use fluorescent labels, um, you can use the red blood cell ghosts, you can do enzyme degradation, you can cross-link proteins using chemicals, and all of these can give you an idea of how proteins work, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that during our Monday session. We can also generate these things called liposomes, which are just synthetic lipid bilayers that are formed in the lab, and we can study proteins by inserting proteins into them. Um, and on the left in this picture you're seeing an EM of actual lipid membranes and you might be asking where do you get lipids? You literally go buy them from the lipid store, okay, and the lipid store sells you phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylserine, sphingomyelin, cholesterol, sometimes phosphatidyl and acetal. You can buy all of these, you can mix them in certain ratios that we know are important for the generation of uh, cell membranes and as I told you earlier membranes will form spontaneously because they're trying to minimize their interaction with water so these liposomes are really quite easy to generate uh, generating proteins and putting them in the liposomes is slightly more advanced but you can imagine take uh, take any protein that you're interested in if you could make a lot of it make it in enough quantity that you mix it with phospholipids and you see after the phospholipids make themselves into liposomes, where does that protein end up? Does it end up in a membrane or does it not end up in a membrane? What would that tell you? Why would you care? These are the types of questions that biologists ask, right? What does this protein do? I know that this protein is made by this particular pathogen, but what does it do? How can I figure out what it does? So you can use uh, the hydropathy plot to look at just the sequence of amino acids to, to get a guess, right? So it gives you a plot and you can guess that that's what's happening, right? We don't know that what's happening is that you've got a seven pass transmembrane protein, right? So it's an estimated guess. You can do freeze fracture technique. You can make some red blood cell ghosts and see, right, what happens if you put your protein in there or not. Or you can make liposomes and see where that protein uh, separates, whether it's in the membrane or not in the membrane. So the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, is detergent. And detergents are used to solubilize membranes. And I don't know about you, but you know, you go to the restroom here at CSUN, you, you do your business, you come out of the stall, you wash your hands, right? So your hands get washed, you use soap, and what soap is actually doing is it's taking off cells. It's removing cells, it's opening up membranes, and right, all of this is dead. Everything on your hands is dead, everything on your lips is dead, all of this is dead skin. So that dead skin comes off pretty easily, and the reason that detergents work is if you look at this picture of detergents, the one on the left, sodium dodecyl sulfate, more commonly known as SDS, it's one of the most um, stringent detergents, it's very powerful, it's basically a long chain of hydrocarbons. And what is that similar to? It's similar to the lipid tails. So these interact with the lipids in membranes and allow for the solubilization of membranes. Okay, the, the detergent on the right, it's called Triton X100. We use it in the lab. It's slightly less, um, I don't know what the word is, harsh. Um, it will allow for solubilization of some membranes, but not all membranes. Um, and obviously, if you use a lot of detergent, in either case, you're going to solubilize more membrane than you would not. 
uh, with smaller amounts. So these two kinds of detergents are really great for doing experiments where you're trying to look at, okay, I have a membrane, what was in that membrane? And here's just a, an idea of how that would work. If you have a, a protein that you think is a transmembrane domain, you could pop open a cell, get rid of all of the material that's inside, and collect just those uh, lipid portions, right, with the proteins still in it. So you do hypotonic lysis, let everything else go away, purify just the membranes, and now you have proteins in a membrane lipid bilayer. How do you get those proteins out? You add in detergent, and so on the right you see the little yellow uh, molecules that look like lollipops. Those are detergents because they only have one tail, right? They have one hydrocarbon tail. So detergents form something called detergent micelles, and so when you add a, if you take a bunch of detergent, put it in water, shake it up, right? What happens? You get tons of bubbles on the top, but you get tons of tiny little bubbles on the inside. Those are detergent micelles that have trapped a tiny little piece of, of air. Okay, but now you add that detergent to your membrane uh, mixture, and what happens is the detergents will bind specifically to the hydrophobic portion of the proteins and release the lipids Right, and it's just out competing. So you have way more detergent than than you need, and it very easily solubilizes the the membrane pr protein from the membrane itself. And then you have to analyze. Okay, what did I get out of this? What was in the membrane fraction of this? So this is just showing you. Okay, we're interested in a protein. The protein we think is in the membrane. We're going to solubilize the membrane. Um, and in this case, the solubilized proteins shown here is the dark green blobs, and then there's some other proteins that have the, the gray. They're purified out of the membrane, and then you can do an additional purification step to find proteins based on size. Well, then you might be able to add those proteins back into a liposome and say, what does that protein do? Does it have a function? How can I determine what the function is? And this one, it's pretty e easy. This is a sodium-potassium pump. So if you want to determine what's the function of this, you might incubate that liposome with the added proteins with so sodium and potassium and see what happens. Does the sodium get pumped anywhere? Does the potassium get pumped anywhere? Can you see that there's an exchange of ions? Is there an ionic charge to the membrane, etc.? So. This is how we start trying to understand the function of proteins. Lastly, SDS page. So SDS is the detergent. Page stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So SDS page electrophoresis is actually redundant. SDS page says that you're going to run a gel. And the gel that we're talking about is basically creating a structure with a polyacrylamide, it's a highly toxic neurotoxin that can be cross-linked and we can run proteins down through this and I think of it as a strainer or a sieve and so the proteins, right, little tiny proteins can go through the holes way faster than big proteins. So big proteins get we call retarded as they're going through the gel and so we can separate proteins based on size and that gives us an idea how big is that protein that we're interested in studying how can we look at that protein is it too large to actually make is it too too large to be blah 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 where where can we use that protein and this is i don't know how many of you have done this a lot of you have done dna gels dna gels you use a slightly different material called agar um, and agar comes from seaweed, but it's a very similar thing to uh, polyacrylamide. Polyacrylamide just makes a very fine mesh as compared to the agar. And in this case, what we're doing is separating the proteins based on size. If you look at the, the gel on the bottom left where they are showing you bands, so A, B, and C on the left are denoting the bands that are in the lane. So the first lane of the gel has bands A and B, whereas the second uh, the second lane in the gel has band C. So in this case, they would actually have to be separated somehow, right, based on size before even being put on the gel. More likely, you're going to see something that looks like on the right hand side is an actual gel. And this is a purification of a protein maybe made in E. coli. 
and on the far left you see a crude cell lysate. So that's every protein that's in the cell. And as they purify it using different methods, they get a more pure, more pure, more pure solution until you get to lane number five where virtually all of the protein that's in that last sample is that 40,000 Dalton molecular weight protein. There are some contaminants in that last uh, lane, but it's the purification from the first lane to the last lane is probably 95% or more. And this is how we do this in order to put proteins inside of liposomes. Okay, so you need to think about membranes, you need to think about proteins, and you need to think about the methods that we use to start understanding proteins and uh, membranes together. And that's it. So we will pick up here on Monday. We'll probably do some learning catalytic quiz stuff. There'll probably be a paper quiz. So get yourselves ready. Monday's going to be a big day. Have a great weekend.